Children of the Great Depression, Chapter 6, Boxcar Kids. A bunch of boys and young men have gathered at a railroad crossing. Some have packs strapped to their backs. Others are holding battered suitcases or have all their belongings tied up in bundles. They are waiting for a freight, tra freight train. They hear two sharp blasts from a locomotive's whistle. Then the train comes rolling into view. As it approaches, they dart out from under bushes, be from behind piles of junk, from the shadows of nearby houses. Running alongside the track, reaching out to grab the steel handrails on the sides of boxcars, they leapt forward and pulled themselves onto the moving train. This was a familiar scene during the 1930s. It was no trick for a swift, skinny kid to grab the rung of a ladder on a slow-moving freight, then climb up on top or swing into an empty boxcar going who knows where, John Gojack recalled. He had done exactly that when he was 12 years old. John was a part of what Fortune magazine called quote, the vast homeless horde, a restless legion of tramps and hobos who took to the nation's rails and roads, hopping freights, thumbing rides, bumming meals as they roamed America. All cities and towns of any consequence had train stations and railroad yards in those days before commercial air, where when people and goods went everywhere by train. By the late by late 1932, at least 250,000 of these Depression-era era nomads were used under the age of 21. Many had been to high school, some to college. Others were barely into their teens, like John Gojak, or e even younger. They had taken to the road for different reasons, because they had failed to find a job near home, because they felt they were a burden to their families. Some had run away from families broken by the pressures of unemployment and poverty. Some had left with their family's blessing. And some had been lured from their depression homes by pure wanderlust, by dreams and excitement and adventure. Whatever their backgrounds and hopes, they kept moving, always on the lookout for a meal, a place to sleep and work, they could do what work what they could could do for pay during the summers of 1932 and 1933 thomas meinhan a graduate student in sociology in the at the Minis university of minnesota dressed as a hobo and rode the rails with boxcar kids he reported his findings in a book called boys and boy and girl tramps of america mine had meinhan found that young people often traveled in pairs or groups for safety especially if they were the girls um, if there were girls among them it was hard to tell how many girls were riding the rails because a large number number of them traveled disguised as boys mobs of men got off every freight train he wrote many were not youths but boys some were girls children really, dressed in overalls or army breeches and boys' coats and sweaters, looking except for the dirt except for their dirt and rags like a Girl Scout club on an outing. And box boxcars and hobo camps, boys and girls are able to associate in large numbers and protect themselves. In the event of loneliness or illness, the boys and girls have friends to comfort and care for them fear of being alone, fear of being spied on, and seized by the first cop who comes along is absent. Some girls found being a female an advantage. It, it was easier for a girl than a boy on the road, recalled Peggy, Peggy Dehart, who was 16 when she set out. People bought us meals and gave us change out of their pockets, and I, and th I doubt that they would do that as readily for a boy. My ha mine hand asked each boy or girl he interviewed, why did you leave home? 
Four out of five stated, definitely hard times drove them away from home, he reported. Most of the boxcar kids, mine hand found, had been on the road an average of 14 months and traveled within a radius of only 500 miles from where they had started. They knew where to find the best shelters, offering a square meal and a bed for the night, and also where police and railroad detectives were most likely to hassle them. Many spent as much time walking along country roads as they did riding rails or hitchhiking. They swapped stories about their travels, told each other where to catch the trains in and out of big towns, how to tell when a train was ready for departure, what part of the train to board. It was dangerous riding the freights, remembered Clarence Lee, a sharecropper's son who was 16 years old at the time. You had to be careful not to stumble or fall under the wheels when you climbed on the cars. You had to jump off at the right time too, because once a train picked up speed, you had a hard time getting off. Sometimes you slept in a boxcar in a railroad rail yard. Next morning, when you woke up, the train would be taken off with you. It was scary and dangerous, but you had to do it to survive. Accidents were common. One misstep could cost you your legs or your life. Thousands of young nomads were injured or crippled while boarding and or leaving moving trains. Run-ins with bulls, railroad detectives, and with local police were also common. It was the job of bulls who patrolled with lanterns and rifles to eject trespassers from railroad property. And many towns were just as unwelcoming, refusing to feed or shelter young wanderers for more than a day before sending them on their way. Officials in some places rounded them up, transported them to the city limits or to the country to the county line, and warned them not to return. Atlanta, a natural way station, natural way station for the hobo route in the south, gives 30-day sentences in the city stockade or in the chain gang to anyone caught on a freight, freight train in Fulton County, reported Fortune magazine. Miami is friendly but firm. The city provides the wanderer with a bathing suit and the unescorted freedom of its famous beach. Afterwards, the vagrant is deported. Each day, the so-called Hobo Express deposits eight or nine boys at the north line of the county with the warning that a return will mean six months of hard labor. Black youths had to contend with strict segregation laws in the South and with discrimination and racism wherever they went. Fifteen-year-old Harold Jeffries and five fro friends rode the rails out of Minneapolis, Minnesota in 1935. As black kids from the North, we'd heard of race, racial discrimination, but not one of us had actual experience with harsh prejudice, he recalled. Our first frightening encounter came at the Union Pacific Roundhouse in Kansas City. Some of the kids drank from the whites only fountain. We were literally run out of the railroad yards. Some young whites in the segregated America of the 1930s had their first personal contact with blacks while riding the rails. Byron Bristol recalled a cold, moonless night in 1933 when he was traveling from Kansas to Denver in a boxcar. At a stop in the dark, another rider climbed into the car. They struck up an animated conversation about their lives and families. It was only at dawn that I discovered my traveling, traveling companion was black, Bristol later said. It was surprising and enlightening for a boy who had been brought up in a white community. In spite of hardships and dangers, many of the boxcar kids seemed to flourish. It's two years since I left home, one boy told Minehan, and I ain't never want to go back yet. No, sir, the old road looks good to me. Square meals don't come every day, but I eat better than I ate at home, and no grief about the old man being out of work all the time. Robert Carter, a box kid, car, boxcar kid from Virginia, kept a diary of his wanderings through the South. Arrived here on a freight train late at night, 
Tired and dirty from the train, smoke, and cinders, he wrote in Greenville, North Carolina. I slept, I slept in the tobacco warehouse with two other young tramps, one having a suitcase crammed with dirty clothes and a blanket smelling of antiseptic. Next morning was cold. The wind hinted, the wind hinted at winter. Leaving town, I turned south, walking the roads. All day, I went steadily, getting an occasional ride from for trucks or fords. When dinner time came, I asked for work at a farmhouse for food and picked peas with the farmer's family for two hours. That night, I pried open a church window and slept there. On his arrival in Marion, Georgia, he wrote, That night I slept on the sal in the Salvation Army. It was crowded with boys and young men, some with small grips, others with nothing but the shirts on their back. One boy, a nightmare of rags and dirt, was so thin and far gone that we tramps ourselves destitute gave him our stock of goods. People were sympathetic to boxcar kids. Folks waved at them from the fields, from porches and backyards as freight went as the freight went rattling past. When they got off the train, strangers invited them into their homes for a meal, pressed dollar bills into their hands on busy street corners, busy city street corners, offered them warm clothes, and bought them bus tickets so they could ride back home in style. Years later, many of them look back at their days on the road as a the great adventure, great adventure of their lives, a time when they were footloose, fearless, and free. My experience on the road gave me self confidence," said another wanderer, Renee Champion. I overcame profound shyness and saw that I could sh shift for myself. I could survive and be respected by people. Without that experience, I don't know what kind of person I would have become. So, um, the pictures. So, here are two boys um, walking uh, alongside trains uh, with their packs that they're carrying uh, in California. Uh, this is two boys uh, hopping a fright in 1935 along a train. This is another traveling in a boxcar between Bakersfield and Fresno, California in April 1940. This is a bull, uh, the railroad detective with a rifle uh, patrolling the top of the train. So sometimes the boys, uh, they would, the boxcar kids would sit up there and um, while they were riding, sometimes they would be on the inside. Uh, other times they would ride on top. Um, so this is, uh, they're helping this new kid uh, get onto the train, helping newcomers climb aboard in a freight car. So a freight car is different than a passenger. Um, it's mostly usually carrying goods or crops or something, uh, maybe animals. Uh, but they're different than the passenger trains. This is a um, kid who is um, a, who was a boxcar kid that was uh, in for the night, maybe at a shelter, uh, a church, or a Salvation Army. Um, Salvation Army would have been like a shelter at that point. Um, for a meal and a bed for the night in Dubuque, Iowa. Uh, here's a family sitting outside uh, the f freight char freight uh, beside the tracks in Washington, Washington State. So it's a family. Uh, looks like maybe a dad, mom, and a couple of kids. So it's not just kids that were. Uh, not just teenagers that were traveling the rails. This was an entire family that was traveling the rails. You can see there that the mother is covering her face. Uh, we can maybe assume that she might be a little bit ashamed or she doesn't really want her picture taken uh, to be recognized that her family is having to resort to this. So, 
Um, and then this is two boys that are uh, riding the rails near Bakersfield, California. So they would stand at the opening, maybe looking for when it's going to slow down so they can get off. So they um, might get off when the train is starting to slow down so they don't get caught into the rail yards. Um, if you get caught in the rail yards, you might get caught by a bull or the police. So there you go. That is... Chapter 6, Children of the Great Depression. Thank you for listening.